I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour through uh, some of the things that are happening that we think are worthy of, of discussion. And the panel, of course, can jump into uh, in more detail. Uh, the GTA asked us to have, to have a little look at, um, for part of, the of their own long term planning, what's actually happening in terms of economic growth uh, in the province? Uh, what does that economic growth mean for passenger travel? Uh, and what are some of the things, some of the questions that we could be asking ourselves today in order to prepare for what's a very, very positive wave of growth for the, uh, uh, for, uh, for the province? Uh, yes, yeah, so, we've, uh, so we've, we've been looking at this. <clears throat> I would say we're very early uh, in the journey here. What we've done is we, we've looked at uh, some economic modeling we've done uh, with Eric Miller at uh, the U of T, Rob Fairholm, Tom McCormack as well from the, the Center for Spatial Economics. These are the guys that have done a lot of the thinking, a lot of the modeling underneath uh, things like places to grow and the big move. So very, very similar assumptions. And we've looked at uh, how do these assumptions play out over the next uh, 30 years? And what does that mean in terms of uh, passenger travel for air travel for the province? And we're just now in the process of sharing this, this very basic set of facts with the regional airports, uh, with the, the federal aviation authorities, uh, some of the ground transportation groups, uh, and we're about to, and that, that's one of the very, very important next steps, also talk to the airlines, just so that we can all see what's actually happening, what are the facts, and then what do we do with these facts uh, to shape our thinking in, uh, in Ontario. And it is a great story for, uh, for this province. It's a great story. Those of us who travel a lot, I'm a two million mile Air Canada uh, traveler, and we all have stories about flying to Moscow, flying to Sao Paulo, uh, flying to Mumbai, and those nightmare uh, travels from the airport into the cities. And we'd love to see Ontario, on the other hand, being a fantastic model where we get this right for the benefit of, uh, of, of everybody. Now, the good news. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we've looked at this across southern Ontario. So you'll all be familiar with the map here, uh, looking at, uh, and we've talked to, uh, to Pearson, of course, and then a number of the regional airports who are also in, uh, in the room today. The big news is Ontario's economy is going to grow to about a trillion dollars in GDP by 2043. Now, for reference, that puts Ontario at about the same size of uh, a New York state today. Massive growth, great news for, uh, for us from a GDP standpoint. What does this mean in terms of population? 15 and a half million people uh, in, uh, in Ontario uh, in 2043. And of course, immediately the question rises, well, how are they going to get about? How are they going to get to the airport? What does that mean for, uh, for air passengers? Ninety million passengers uh, air travel demand in 2043, an enormous number of people, which, um, of course, raises questions about how are we going to get all those people to the airport, to the airports that they need to get to in order to, in order to travel. Now, just a word about the GDP growth. GDP growth, of course, is largely correlated with population growth. And there are a number of positive factors driving uh, GDP growth. Foreign direct investment from China. We do a lot of work with foreign governments. Uh, now, in Ontario, about 100,000 people or so move to Ontario every year. In China, 100,000 people move every week into the cities. And as those cities get bigger and as those people get richer, that also means a greater number of people who want to travel. China will build around 90 airports over the next 10 years. We have around 30 or so larger ones in Canada. So they're, they're going to actually build a complete Canada. All the infrastructure we have in Canada today, they will be building that size of infrastructure in China over the next 10 years. An extraordinary demand. We have benefited increasingly from foreign direct investment uh, in, in Ontario. Now, we all know some of the, the tougher stories around automotive, the automotive sector. But net-net is a positive story over the next, uh, um, over the next years in terms of growing uh, in, in Canada. We, we are terrifically blessed by being close to Asia, close to Europe, uh, and that uh, the foreign direct investment will help enhance that growth. Population will continue rising. That's all good things for our, uh, for our GDP. Now, what does that mean for, uh, uh, for passenger travel? Today, in the, uh, in the province, we have around 42.2 uh, million passengers. 
Now, if we play that, uh, that story forward, so given the GDP growth, given the growth uh, uh, in air travel, what that means is in around 2043, um, we're going to be at capacity for the province. Now, all we've taken into account on this page is the planned capacity increase at Pearson, not the other airports. There are other plans out there, so call this a base case. Right, if we don't do much else than what Pearson has in its plans, this is what we get to, but 2043. Now, we also know, this is a nice straight line on this graph. What that also means, though, is there are pinch points. We all know there's volatility. Uh, and so even though it looks like capacity is, is maxed out at 2043, we're going to feel some very, very tough days, some, a lot of congestion on those days well before uh, that time frame is up. So we have to think about this uh, in advance. It's around a 20-year, 15, 20-year planning cycle too, when you're thinking about large capital infrastructure development like this. All the more reason, therefore, to think about this and get out ahead of this um, today. Now, another way to think about this is, when you look at the 24 million additional passengers above the capacity point that we could have in the province, those passengers could fly through our airports. They could also go somewhere else. We're not very far from the US, let's not forget that. So one of the interesting questions today is whether or not we can work collaboratively to look at this, look at this growth, and then think through what's the right answer for Ontario in order that we get those 24 million additional passengers through our system. And by the way, that corresponds approximately with about a $17 billion GDP impact. If we get those 24 million passengers to fly through our system. That's a good economic hit, uh, a positive hit, which could help finance a lot of the infrastructure build that we all know uh, that, that we need. Now, I should have said, too, in the previous page, that's just the passenger uh, 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 travel. But of course, we need also to look, as we're going forward, at cargo and business travel to have a segmented look for the implications for the other uh, segments. Uh, and we, we should be doing that in the, uh, in the, in the coming weeks. Now, this is something that's close to home for all of us. Just how long does it take me to get to the airport? in this super busy Ontario over the next few years. Well, some great work done here um, by uh, Eric Miller, who's, who specializes in this. He's done the modeling for, uh, for congestion uh, 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 underlies a number of the other plans that are out there. Yeah, if you look at the uh, average travel time for the midnight to uh, like 10 a.m. slot, on average, it takes you 27 minutes today, and it'll go up to 30 minutes uh, in 2043. And just looking at the rest of the chart, downtown Hamilton, 66 minutes today to 82 minutes, 2043. Pickering Town Center, 54 to 71. So we see quite a big increase. Now, I need to underline that this is the average travel time, the average travel time during that entire time slot. We all know that we can occasionally get a run to Pearson from here, maybe 20 minutes. But how often does that happen? And when we actually drive at rush hour, we all have those days where it's dramatically different from this picture up on the screen. And we need to bring that out, I think, in the next, next iteration of this. And the message is that as we're planning our own uh, air travel, and we're all putting in that buffer, that, 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 that time we have to leave the house to get to the airport in time, that buffer is going to go up and up because we have more and more of those tough days when it takes a lot longer than we want it to take. And that then uh, has an impact on certain choices that we make. Uh, and it brings out the point here that as we look at air travel, we have to look at ground transportation as well. Because the people who are traveling by plane happen to be on the road at the same time as everybody else in getting to work and coming home from work. So dramatic increase, 25 to 30% increase in driving times to get to the airport at Pearson. And, and these peaks are at the same time with general commuters, which give us a, a, a kind of a double whammy uh, and makes it, uh, uh, you know, makes it difficult. And then remember, these are averages, so half the time is going to be worse than this. And we all know those peak moments when it's, uh, it's particularly challenging. Now, as we think forwards for um, Pearson, uh, Toronto Pearson uh, is increasingly becoming just a terrific global hub. Look at the size of, uh, of Heathrow, right? and Normand is going to talk about that uh, in a minute. The size of Dubai, Charles de Gaulle, Singapore. We're already 38.6 million passengers. We're going to grow to about 65 million or so passengers by 2043. Huge growth. And that really puts us in the big leagues in terms of major airport uh, and, and, and the economic growth that comes, uh, that comes with that. Pearson, interestingly, is already the number two 
international gateway uh, in North America after JFK with the, the number of international passengers that we have. Now, looking forward, so what do we do with this? Uh, what are some of the potential options? Well, largely speaking, uh, uh, there are three. Uh, first of all, we could build a massive new single large airport, a bit like Dubai. Fantastic airport. You can buy a car in that airport if you want with fantastic retail and, and so on. Uh, so you could have one large airport, but how many of us think we're actually going to put down the cash to build a brand new large airport somewhere in the, uh, you know, in, in the Toronto area? So that's a bit unrealistic, but it is an option, one of them. Second option, uh, actually, let me go to option three first of all. Option three, status quo. And basically in the status quo, so Pearson builds out to its full capacity, and then other airports uh, also build out as, as, as best they can, uh, and the ground transport is also developed. But it's not done in a particularly coordinated way. There is collaboration, obviously, but there isn't a master plan. There isn't a single plan where all these different plans are taken into account and scenarios developed, which includes airports and ground transportation with a series of possible scenarios from which everybody can benefit. That doesn't exist today. Uh, but it is an option, which is simply to, to, to move forward the way we have. Um, and Berlin and what's happening in Berlin, not a particularly uh, a good example of the, of the result there. And the second option, one in the middle, uh, is another way to think about this. Think about uh, the regional airports creating a network across uh, uh, southern Ontario. And it could be a mixture. You could imagine dual hubs. You could imagine hub and spoke. You could also imagine separate O and D, origin and destination focused airports across the province, where a number of airports are taking on passengers from their region and flying those passengers out, as opposed to having them uh, to come through, come through Pearson. So different ways to play this. As I mentioned before, we're not uh, today recommending anything. We just have a very early set of facts that we've shared with you today, which we are in the process of taking around airports, Metrolinks, uh, the feds, as, uh, and next, of course, the, uh, the, the, the airlines. A lot of possible solutions. Now, we're going to hear from some other folks who are uh, very knowledgeable about, uh, so what's been the experience elsewhere? And I'm sure you'll have some good questions uh, to ask Tom and, and Normand. But uh, there are increasing number of uh, multi-airport systems across the globe. Now, the word system suggests central planning, but, but I, would say, I would say collaboration, call it that, it's probably better. So systems are groups of airports with a lot of, uh, of collaboration. And uh, interestingly, in those multi-airport groupings, uh, we often see different roles uh, uh, across different airports. Uh, uh, so a, a trickle down of specialization, uh, something that Jeff Wilson had, had, uh, had pointed out this morning uh, from Billy Bishop, a trickle down of specialization could be part of the answer as well. And the GTA is, is, is working closely with different stakeholders uh, to, to think about what the best way is to move forwards on this, given the facts that we just, uh, we just shared today. A number of examples on the right. I'm not going to go into those in, in detail, but, you, but you, you're all familiar with them. Uh, the way uh, London works. Well, let's, let's hear from Normand about that one. Or the story uh, in, uh, in, in New York uh, with JFK taking the international travel. And, and then Newark and LaGuardia are specializing a little bit more in, uh, in, more local, uh, in, in more local transit. Very important to finish off. Ground transportation, we all know it, is an integral component for a regional uh, airport system. It has to work. We all think about how we're going to get to the airport uh, in, in the right time. Ground transportation, it, it, it's really important to increase airport access. Uh, to connect airports to city centers, uh, and that really requires integrated planning across railways, across roads, uh, uh, you know, across the metro, uh, to make sure folks can get there. Some airports, arguably, have gotten it right. Um, uh, Heathrow, the Heathrow Express, we're all familiar with that rapid uh, transit system to get into, uh, into London. Hong Kong, something that Howard was involved in that story, the Hong Kong story, uh, and Washington as well. Others have perhaps struggled a bit. Uh, go, to, go to LA, go to Houston, even Chicago, where it's tough to get into the city once you've got to the airport. So there are some good examples here, some not so good examples. And, uh, and one of the, the very important um, leave behind so far is we're all familiar with the plans that are out there. Uh, the regional express rail plans, uh, the smart track plan for the city the proposed GTA West corridor in the bottom left there for, for road transport, 
And we all applaud the UP Express, which is fantastic. But bottom line, the UP Express, it's great, but it's only going to take 800 people uh, peak hour capacity, uh, serving around a million riders in the first year and two and a half million by year three. That's only about 8% or so of traveling passengers. The other 92% are still on the road. That's not going to make your drive to Pearson a whole lot better. So what we'd say there is it's terrific to have it. It's very necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need other answers too. And for all the other plans that are out there, proposed smart track, regional express rail, et cetera, they need to think of the last mile to the airport. There's, there's a lot of miles that have been put out there, but the last few are critically important to get people where they need to go to the airports in order for those airports to become uh, the very attractive growers and contributors to the economy that they, they'd love to be uh, uh, going forwards. So just to finish off then with um, uh, uh, just a very quick summary. As we're thinking in Ontario about uh, a regional air traffic growth, airports are economic catalysts. The term aerotropolis has become popular, as Joe mentioned. Uh, they drive major regional economic benefits. We think that uh, the GTAA, for example, is the number two employer in the province in terms of jobs and so on around the airport, linked to the airport. Over 40,000 people working there just today. Global cities have got this right. Smart cities have prioritized airports as part of their growth plans. That's a, that's a, a, key, a key play that works. Uh, there's multiple ways to think through how we uh, accommodate and invest correctly uh, in airports. But most importantly, those plans have to include ground transport as part of an integrated set of solutions that makes sense for, makes sense for everybody.